Well, hello, Ray, to you. And good afternoon, friends and members of St. Martin Lutheran Church, or those who are uh, members of another church and are just joining us today. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Birch Run, a nice day today. It really feels warm. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's much in the in the mid 30s, but it, it feels like spring anyway. I'm, I'm starting to get that, get that feeling. Uh, fishing is just around the corner. Although, um, just yesterday, it's nice here in in Saginaw. At least I know Covenant Hospital. I, I can't speak for the others. Um, it, I think February, just a few days ago, they permitted visitors again in the hospital, and it's been a, it's been a long time since. I myself or other people have been able to visit people in the hospital unless under dire circumstances. And uh, on my way to the hospital, I noticed uh, on the Saginaw River lots of ice guys ice fishing, and I hear they're they're catching some some nice walleye out of the Saginaw River. So I just kind of sigh as I drive by. I sigh <sighs> on the way to the hospital, right? But uh, fishing time will come. That will come. We got stuff to focus on today. Hi, Arlene, uh, Karen, and Jenny. Uh, good to see you. Um, our scripture for today is from Mark chapter 8, as I had mentioned yesterday. That's our, that's our gospel for this Sunday. Um, and a special welcome, if you're able to join us in person for worship this evening, uh, we're beginning our youth-led uh, worship services where our young people help in uh, pretty much all aspects of the service. They're going to be doing uh, a not only a, sort of a dramatized uh, reading of Deuteronomy 5 as well as... Um, as a skit about uh, focusing on the Ten Commandments and the law of God and how the law of God impacts our life. And so that's going to be our sort of our message for this evening. So uh, join us online at 6 or in person would be great too. Uh, we will be, as we always do on Wednesday evenings, uh, celebrating the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, aside from that, uh, things are going as they go. Um, so, if you're following along in your Bibles, we are in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, and we are beginning with the 27th verse. So Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, our, our reading begins, Jesus went on with the disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, a Gentile region, and, and he asks the disciples a question. And his question is really, he's asking this question as an introduction to more, a more important follow-up question, but he begins with who do, literally it says, who do men say that I am, or who do people, who are, what are the people saying? Who are they saying uh, that I am? And they reply, well, some think you're John the Baptist and others Elijah or one of the prophets. And, and what's interesting is both John the Baptist and Elijah were, in a sense, national reformers who stood up to the corrupt rulers of their day. And, you know, some were looking to Jesus as this sort of 
champion of national repentance. Um, like John the Baptist, some thought Jesus was a famous worker of miracles, like Elijah had done. Um, some thought Jesus was someone who spoke the words of God like a prophet. And, you know, those are all interesting that they would confuse Jesus with John when they sort of ministered at the same time. But, of course, you know, didn't have the Internet then. Um, not everybody had an opportunity to see them both in the same room. Um, but really, that, that question, who, who do people say that I am, is just an introduction to the more important question, which is, who do you say that I am? And whenever I read this in Scripture, you know, I, I, I picture Jesus speaking to, to me. You know, the, the you in the Greek is a plural you. It's a y'all in the south or you guys in the north. But who do you, as, as a plural you, who do you say that I am? And, and I always picture that Jesus saying that to me. And, and, and he does through God's word. He's saying that to you specifically. He's saying, in a sense, I, I, I don't care what the world says about me. What do you say about me? Who do you say that I am? You know, it was fine for the disciples to know what others thought about Jesus, but Jesus wanted them as individuals to know what they believed. And, and, and Peter says in, in one of his best moments, you are the Christ. Uh, in the Greek, Petros lege auto su ai ho Christos, su hai o Christos, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the anointed. You are the Messiah. And, you know, uh, calling Jesus the Messiah was correct. He was right, but easily misunderstood in the context of their time. Um, in the thinking, most of the people in Jesus, really towards the close of the Old Testament period, the word anointed, the Christos, Christ, Messiah, it, it assumed a special meaning that it sort of denoted the ideal king who would be anointed and empowered by God to deliver his people and establish Israel back to her rightful place. That was, the, that was the general understanding of the Messiah that everyone was waiting for. And so, so we're doing fine. Peter's doing okay up to now. You are the, the Christ, the Christos, great. And then in verse 31, it's interesting, we read that, and he began to teach them. So this is a new teaching. It's almost like Jesus is bringing them along. He's bringing them along. And in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and three days rise again. And he said this plainly. You know, to add that he wasn't speaking in a parable here. This wasn't, this wasn't some mysterious teaching. He was speaking very plainly about what the Messiah, that the Messiah, the Messiah must suffer many things. And, and of course, Jesus was likening back to the Old Testament, to the words of the prophet. You know, specifically Isaiah, Isaiah 53, where we read, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And like sheep we have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Isaiah, the prophet, 500 years before, had prophesied about this Messiah, this suffering servant, that our iniquities would crush him, would crush him, and that we like sheep have gone astray. And, and we've all turned each to our own way. And keep that in mind, because that, that very thought that Peter picks up goes their own way. And Peter takes him aside and began to rebuke him. So imagine this. Imagine, you know, we just got over a big, a big campaign, Senate, uh, Congress, and presidential campaign. Uh, imagine, um, and I, I have some friends who have worked on some political campaigns, but imagine, you know, you have a, a, a man or a woman, uh, it's, it's your candidate, you are, you are behind her 100 step of the way. You, you support her financially, you, you hand out brochures at people's houses, uh, you, you go to rallies, you, she has your full support. And then two days before the election, she comes up and says, by the way, I'm gonna head to Washington, but I'm gonna be rejected and they're going to kick me out and I have no chance. Um, in a sense, you would think, what's the purpose of that? And, and this is where Peter is at. He, he rebukes Jesus. 
And, 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 and he says, in a sense, this can't be. Why? Because in Peter's mind, in, in the people in first century Palestine's mind, the Messiah, that's not what the Messiah did. But of course, they were either ignorant or misunderstood the scriptures. And Jesus's response, get behind me, Satan. One of his harshest rebukes that we have from our Lord in the New Testament. And, you know, I, I read this, this quote regarding this, that you don't have to be demon-possessed to be used by Satan. And we need to be on guard. In a sense, it's not saying Peter was, was demon-possessed when Jesus says Satan. In a sense, he's saying adversary. But he was being used by Satan in that moment. That, um, and, and Matthew 16 gives a little more insight into this instance where we read, that after Peter made the confession that you are the Christ, and then he adds the Son of the living God in, in, in Matthew, that Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So in Matthew, Jesus says to Peter, Look, this confession you made that I'm the Christ, God has revealed that to you. That You didn't come about that by your own understanding. And so here, here are sort of the steps Peter follows. He confesses Jesus as the Messiah. In Matthew, Jesus compliments him, telling him that it was the Father who had revealed this to him. Jesus then goes on to tell the disciples of his suffering and his death and resurrection, and, and Peter feels this isn't right, um, and, and, and he rebukes Jesus. And Jesus rebukes him right back and says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, adversary. Um, you know, in one moment, Peter is speaking as a messenger of God, and then the next he's speaking as a messenger of Satan. Um, in that, as one of the early church fathers wrote, that Jesus knew there was a satanic purpose in discouraging him from his ministry on the cross. A satanic purpose. And, uh, um, you know, Peter simply let his mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God. And, and, and Satan, as Luther said, Satan took advantage of it. He took advantage of it. And, and, and so after this rebuke, and I imagine Peter stinging at this moment, um, in verse 34, it says, and calling the crowd to him. So, you know, I, I kind of think about in my own time, you know, if you got a bunch of kids and you're dealing with one kid does something and you're like, all right, you know, everyone come here. And you, you kind of want to address everyone. So up until this point, Jesus has been focusing with the disciples. And in verse 34, he calls the crowd to him. And he says, look, listen. And, and he's, he's, in a sense, he's talking directly to Peter here, but of course he's addressing the crowd. Look, if anyone would come after me, he says, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Peter's response to Jesus' prediction that he was going to suffer and die and be resurrected Peter's response was not a denial of his self. Peter's response was an embracing of his own nature. That's not the way I think it should be. That's not the way I think it should go. And so Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross. Now, I agree in, in, in sort of our modern times. I think, you know, in and inside and outside of the church, we, we've done, you know, a pretty good job in sort of sanitizing and, and just ritualizing the cross. And, and you know, I mean, for some, it's just an, an accoutrement, right? It, it, it's earrings or a tattoo or it's something that makes us feel good. Instead, you know, Jesus is saying denying yourself and taking up your cross, these are, in a sense, the, the same things. And that taking up your cross, it, it's a one-way trip. It's a one-way trip. It's no round trip, and it's a one-way trip to death, to the denial of yourself. And, you know, sometimes when we think of, of denying self, we, we liken that to self-denial, right? And during Lent, this always comes up amongst... Lutherans have always had an issue with Lent, especially the, the idea of giving something up, right? We're never quite sure what to do with that. We know our brothers and sisters who are Roman Catholic, you know, they do the fish thing on Fridays, and we wonder, you know, are we supposed to give things up or not? And, you know, here's, here's the point with Lent. If, if you choose to... to in self-denial, give something up, 
during these these 40 days. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. It's a spiritual practice. It's a good thing. I think, in a sense, it can strengthen faith. It can make you feel closer to God. But by no means is this denying yourself. Uh, self-denial, and I'm not going to eat chocolate for 40 days, this is not the denying yourself that Jesus is talking about here. And um, denying self means to live as an others-centered person. Um, when we deny ourselves, in a sense, we surrender ourselves to Christ, and we determine to obey His will. We we sacrifice ourselves on the altar, and give ourselves over to God. So it's a subtle difference, but an important one between denying self and self denial. And then you know, to wrap it up, Jesus says, "Look, whoever loses his life for my sake, and the gospels will save it." that uh, you'll you'll never live, Jesus says, until you walk down death row with me. Um, you can't gain resurrection without dying first. And what has to die and that's yourself. But just like as a seed is planted and it dies and it grows, um, the seed seems to be dead and buried, but instead it it is freed to be what it was intended to be. So, you know, meditate upon that this week. What What... You know, in your heart, when we hear Jesus say, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you know, I think it's important that we meditate on that and really think about what that means in our lives so that we can communicate that to other people. Um, it, it's not something I think that's easily just, you know, this is what it means, but as we live it out, it begins to make sense as we, in a sense, sacrifice ourselves to the will of God in our lives. Um, amen. But in, in, in doing this, the hymn that I chose was, Oh Christ, You Walk the Road. And uh, it's, it's, now this, this hymn was actually written in the 20th century um, by a Reverend Herman Stumpful. And I don't know if I'm saying his name right. He was a former president of uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary in Gettysburg. He was a pastor. He retired in 1989, author of several books and articles and hymns. And, uh, uh, he passed away in, in 2007 in uh, serving a congregation in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, but I really, really like this, this, this hymn, O Christ, You Walk the Road. Again, it has sort of, it's in a minor, it's a minor key. It has an ominous tone, but it's talking about the road Christ walks and, and what he sacrificed in order for you and I to have redemption in his name. Oh Christ, you walk the road, our wandering feet must go. You faced with us temptation's power and fought our ancient foe. No bread of earth alone can fill our hungry Lord, help us seek your living word, the food your grace imparts. No blinding sign we ask, no wonder from above. Lord, help us place our trust alone in your unswerving. Lures of easy gain, what promise brightly shine? Lord, help us seek your kingdom first, our wills with yours align. O Christ, you walk the road, our wandering feet must go. Stay through temptations out to fight our ancient foe. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Receive the Lord's blessing and be a blessing to others. 
Love you guys. Uh, we'll see some of you tonight or perhaps online tonight. And may God bless the rest of your week.